we are uh, welcoming Professor uh, Fumiaru Kato from Tokyo Institute of Technology, whose uh, work fundamentally uh, uh, participate to the development of log geometry and who uh, make us the honor to give us an introductory talk on the log compactification of middle stack of curves so that we can benefit from his uh, insight. So thank you, Professor Kato, if you want to begin. So thank you very much for the introduction. And also I thank the organizers of this beautiful uh, online seminar. And I'm very happy uh, to have this opportunity to, to speak to you about my very old uh, works and also about my one of my favorite uh, topics in mathematics, which is log geometry. So here is my title of, title of my talk, and this is my slide. And uh, this is about log compactification of moduli, stacks of curves. Uh, but uh, mostly the one third of my, uh, I'm sorry, two thirds of my talk uh, is gonna be devoted onto the introduction to the log geometry itself. And the other one third is gonna be um, survey of my um, actually doctor theaters 20, uh, more than 20 years ago about the uh, moduli of log curves. And the first part of my talk uh, is about the introduction, introduction of the introduction, so to speak. It's a very, very uh, small introduction only consisting of uh, five or six uh, slides about what we are gonna talk about. <clears throat> So now we start um, for, from a very, very classical theory of moduli space of stable curves. This has been already known I mean, more than 50 years ago. And here is a definition of the stable curves. It is proper flat morphism with geometric connected reduced fibers. So reduced is one of the most important part in the, in the definition of dimension one with some sections as high coming from the base space and the smooth locus of the total space X, such that uh, two properties should be satisfied. The property A is that the singularities on each geometric fiber are at most nodes, the ordinary double points. The other condition we have to impose is that automorphism of each geometric fiber with sections fixed is finite. And there is also another way of describing the second condition, but I think all of you know about this. And then the, the most important theorem uh, proven by Deleen and Mumford in 1969 is the following one. So the stable curves of the fixed type consisting of the genus G and the number of marked points N form actually a proper smooth the lean Manfold stack uh, denoted by this very famous notation M bar G comma N of relative dimension three G minus three plus N over Z, which admits a projective cosmodular space. And this I think is a very, very beautiful theorem uh, describing a very beautiful space, very be beautiful stack with maybe a little less beautiful projected, but uh, I mean, uh, less beautiful, but is more visible. So this is a very famous, and maybe all of you know. And on the other hand, you also have a very big framework of log geometry, so to speak. So the log geometry we are now going to discuss is a log geometry by Fontaine UZ and Kazuya Kato. So my name is also Kato, but I'm not Kazuya Kato. Uh, I'm another Kato. So Kazuya Kato is you know, I mean, everybody knows, very famous mathematician. And this um, log geometry actually is born from discussion between Fontaine and Illusy in Paris Metro in early 1980s. And has further developed by Kazuya Kato in the second half of 1980s. And this geometry actually contains usual theory of schemes uh, as well as toric geometry and also geometry of log pairs, which I'm going to explain later slide. Uh, in, in this sense, I mean, the log geometry is a very broad 
uh, very general framework of uh, algebraic or arithmetic geometry, which really contains the theory of schemes inside it. So then from this, you can fantasize, for example, think about uh, log EGA or log SGA or and so on and so on. You can really generalize the scheme theory itself. So um, among many notions which are very important and very interesting in log geometry is a log smoothness and which is perhaps the most important concept in log geometry, which is like magic powder according to Kazuya Kato. He said that log smoothness is a kind of magic uh, by, by which you can make some singular spaces into smooth space. So it is like a, a kind of a very, uh, how to say, miraculous sort of um, magic, which really widens the range of smooth object uh, in a sense that certain singular object can be seen as a smooth object. So this is a kind of honest uh, generalization of the smoothness in the framework of log geometry. You will see it is really natural, but it is quite powerful for us to pretend that some of the singular spaces are really smooth. And this is really one of the key points in, uh, in, uh, in, the, in the theory of log curve zones and also the modular. Okay. Then I proceed. <clears throat> so then uh, now we have uh, moduli of stable curves on one hand and log geometry on the other hand. So then there should be some moduli theory of log stable curves, which somehow synthesize these two seeming, seemingly different theory into one theory. And so I'm going to explain why this mixture is interesting, a reasonable project to do. So why? So the reason of the uh, idea of the reason, the first is that, so if you look at the boundary of the Dorine Manfort uh, moduli space, I mean, uh, the complement of the smooth part, I mean, the, uh, the part, of the, part of the smooth curves, then this boundary is like a, is like a normal crossing device. It's a, it's a normal crossing device. And if you have a space on, on one hand, if you have a normal crossing device on the other hand, then you have canonically a log structure. You will see why from the pair of this space and normal crossing device. So it is quite canonical uh, to think about this. So this is the first idea. And the second idea says that if you look at the universal family, then the base space, you have a very canonical log structure. And also the total space also can be cooked up to a canonical sort of log uh, stack, log space, in such a way that this morphism of stacks can be seen naturally as a morphism log stack, uh, in a sense of myself, uh, which I'm going to explain in the later slides, and which is moreover log smooth. So this is, it is a second very important point to think about this. The third point is that uh, since stable curves are log smooth, I mean, stable curves itself are log smooth, the moduli space of smooth object is always already compact. So this is the third point. So that means that, uh, as I said, log smooth is like a magic powder, which makes some singular spaces to be smooth. And actually, the logs, uh, the stable curves can be seen in a sort of natural way as a log smooth object. So if you think about the moduli of log smooth object, then you can reasonably expect that this space is already compact. So you don't have to think about, you don't have to worry about compact compactification. So if it is correct, then it's a kind of paradise, right? I mean, uh, why um, every time you have a mo uh, moduli space, then you have to worry about what is the compactif compactification next time. But in log geometry, you don't have to do that. I mean, the first object you get is already compact. So of course, I mean, things are not so easy like this, but uh, this is the first sort of um, motivation, motivating idea. And another motivation is a more, is more how to say, 
pragm pragmatic. So there used to be no modular theory in log geometry, and I thought there should be, there should be at least one. So this, this was the situation more than 20 years ago. Okay, so these are the motivating ideas why we think it is interesting and reasonable to think about uh, the moduli of curves in the framework of log geometry, uh, which is the thing we are now going to do uh, for, for some, uh, something like two and a half an hour. Okay. Then before going into the introductory part of the log geometry, I'm going to just introduce some of the references. So the first reference is uh, the famous paper by Kazuya Kato himself, uh, Logarithmic Structure of Fontaine in EUZ, uh, which has been published in 1989. And this is really the first and uh, very famous uh, literature maybe the first appearance of, appearance of the log geometry in literature. The second one is the, the, is the paper by Martin Olson, uh, logarithmic geometry and algebraic stack. Um, I am not going to explain much about this paper, but I will mention a little part of this in the, in the end of my introductory part of log geometry. So this is also a very, very uh, important sort of, uh, important piece of work in the, in the genesis of the, the modern log geometry, I would say. The third one is uh, Arthur Olga's book, Lectures on Logarith Logarithmic Algebraic Geometry, which has been actually published, published quite recently, 2018. And um, before this book, there was no systematic and full-fledged book about the log uh, geometry, but we have now this book. So if you read this book from the beginning to the end, then you are simultaneously, uh, you know, um, uh, quite adept about log geometry. And the two things in the below are my pieces of work. So the first one is my master thesis, log smooth deformation theory, part of which I will mention in the later slides. And the second one is the is the, the piece of work which has which is going to be uh, the main topic about the later, I mean the one the last one third of my talk. This is my doctor thesis, log smooth deformation and moduli of log smooth curves. So these are the sort of basic literatures, and of course there are much more. And from time to time, I'm going to point out some of the uh, some of the literature which has not uh, been included here. Okay, so then I go to the uh, log geometry part, unless there is a question from one of you. Is it okay? So now I go to the introduction to log geometry. So then this log geometry part starts from the introduction of the log geometry. <laughs> so introduction after introduction. I am very sorry for that. So the the first motivating example for the log geometry, maybe I should explain the why log geometry has been, uh, has been considered. So first motivating example for the uh, log geometry would be this, namely the mixed Hoji structure by the Lean. So he said that if you have a variety defined over the complex numbers, then this variety can naturally has a mixed Hoji structure possessed by uh, cohomologies with several uh, coefficients together with filtrations, the weight filtration W and the Hodge filtration F. Okay, and to explain the idea, let us suppose that U, our variety is smooth, which can be, which is now embedded into a proper variety X, proper smooth variety X, with the complement being equal to normal crossing divisor. This can be uh, realized by uh, um, uh, Nagata's compactification together with the Hironaka's resolution. Okay, then the, the most important uh, object to think is the logarithmic differential complex, omega dot bracket log D, 
So this is the most important thing to consider here. Why it is so important is that uh, this thing is a subsheaf into a little more gigantic sheaf, the direct, the direct image of the uh, usual drum complex of the, of the open part, which is actually quasi isomorphism. So you don't have to think about this big part, but only you can restrict to a more tamed part, which is actually a nice uh, uh, sheaf, complex of sheaves. And by this, the, uh, the cohomology can be realized, as naturally realized as the cohomology of this complex of logarithmic differentials. So this is I mean, the very, very condensed sort of way of explaining the most important part of this theory of mixed logic structure. So this is one of the uh, very important motivating example for the log, log geometry. Second one uh, I would mention is that the, um, is, is this theory about lo, uh, limiting Hodge structure uh, developed by several people, including Steenbrink, is a very, very old uh, uh, work. Um, and this uh, deals with the so-called semi-stable reduction, which is this diagram. Uh, in the middle, you have a morphism, which is proper and flat over uh, open disk delta. And uh, of course, we have to put more condition on it. For example, it is uh, if you take a pullback uh, onto the punctured disk, then you get something smooth, smooth and proper. While if you take the pullback on the origin, that means if you take the closed uh, the, the central fiber, then this is a normal crossing divisor into X. So in this situation is so-called the semi-stable reduction. Then the theory of limit Hodge structure asserts that the cohomology, the general fiber, cohomology of general fiber where T is not equal to zero carries the so-called limiting Hodge structure that measures the Hodge structure of the central fiber. So how can it be done? The most important part consists of considering Similarly, the log complex, but in a little more slightly different way, different one. So that this is a so-called relative log complex. So you first think about the relative log complex of this uh, morphism, morphism sitting in the middle, and then take a pull it, take a pullback onto the closed fiber, the central fiber. So you only think about the uh, the object onto the central fiber. So in, in a way, somehow you discard everything outside the central fiber, okay? But nevertheless, if you take the cohomology of this complex, then you actually recover the general fiber. That means that this complex is quasi isomorphic to the nearby cycles. So that is the most important part of his uh, uh, Steenbrink's, Steenbrink's work. Uh, which has been published from Inventiones Mathematica in 1976, a very, very, uh, quite a long time ago. Okay, so, um, so we have explained two examples in which we encounter with something logarithmic differentials, something like diff logarithmic differentials. So in, in this sense, um, in these theories, uh, there is a logarithmic differential in the core part, in a sense that uh, to, to form a very, very important part of the argument. So this means that uh, we really have to look at this uh, logarithmic differentials. And here is the brief introduction of what logarithmic differentials are. For example, if I start from the normal crossing divisor situation, which I will call NCD situation, in a sequel, namely, if you have a, a smooth uh, space, smooth uh, variety schemes and so on, uh, embedded into a proper space X with 
the uh, um, complement being equal to the NCD relative to the base space S, then you can always form the sheaf of uh, logarithmic one forms, which is by definition the OX sub module of the direct image of the usual one form. Uh, I'm very sorry. So here it is. Sorry. So the usual one form of the open part. I'm sorry. So this is omega one u over s is the correct. Uh, it, it, it is a uh, OX sub module of this. It are locally generated by the um, <clears throat> um, uh, I'm sorry, so here, here's also something is missing. So D should be here, sorry. D, the, the uh, differential of the holomorphic functions or regular functions on X and the logarithmic differential of some function, logarithmic differential of some function F coming from this a little bit peculiar looking sheaf, which is a sheaf of monoids, subsheaf of monoids in OX, where OX is seen as a sheaf of monoid by multiplication. Okay. So this is the definition of the log differential. So it is something, uh, uh, how to say, um, coming from the usual uh, differential coming from the usual uh, regular function together with some additional part coming from a little uh, augmented sort of functions, augmented coming from the non-zero function on the open part, which is, uh, <clears throat> which might be, might be zero on, on the normal crossing divisor itself. So, uh, there are nice properties about this uh, this sheaf. For example, this sheaf in this situation is locally free actually. So you cannot expect that this sheaf is uh, is locally free. I mean, you can say that, um, of course, I mean, this is quasi coherent, but it is, I mean, far from coherent. But this thing actually is locally free. And you can also describe the free base locally in a sort of very easy way. For example, if your divisor is described in terms of coordinates like this, then this sheaf is actually free with basis, this. So it comes from the log differential of the first R coordinates followed by the, the other coordinates, the usual differential. <clears throat> okay. Okay, so, so this is the brief introduction to the log, uh, log differentials. And in order to get into the, uh, into the main part of the log geometry, I would like to mention one more motivating example for the log geometry. So, which is actually this, it is a logarithmic differentials in toric geometry. So you will see that log geometry is closely related to toric geometry. So it is a good idea for you, for us to discuss about toric geometry in the beginning of the introduction, in the, in the beginning of the log geometry. For example, if you have a toric variety coming from a fan, the capital sigma, and if you pick up a fan, I'm, I'm sorry, the corn inside a fan, then you can think about the similar uh, log differentials onto the, the affine part corresponding to sigma with the log pole uh, sitting in the, uh, the divisor of this affine part corresponding to sigma, which is actually equal to this very tame looking, nice looking sheaf, which is the tensor product of your structure sheaf Tensor product over Z. This is also a kind of a, a nice point. With the uh, this 
sort of uh, combinatorial part. And this is actually the entrance or uh, entrance to the, the notion of Ishida's complex, so to speak, Ishida's complex. There are two notions of Ishida's complex. Uh, I mean, like homology and cohomology. Uh, this is a cohomology sort of part. And in particular, if you pick up the all uh, stable, uh, the torus stable, torus invariant divisor, then the log complex is going to be just a free, free uh, OX module with the combinatorial part is like this. So here M is the is the character group of the torus. I mean, as as usual in the in the theory of toric varieties. Okay. So so in this slide, I wanted to say that I mean, also in the toric geometry, log differentials uh, somehow takes a very very essential and important role. Like for example, Ishida's complex describes the very very uh, refined uh, structure of, or for example, the singularities and also many many. Uh, topological structure of the toric variety itself. So it is a very, very important sort of notion that uh, they, they actually come from the, uh, the, the log differentials. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. Now, then I let us gradually get into the uh, main body of the introduction of the log geometry. So, so the intro, actually, so the log geometry deals with monoids or more precisely, sheaves of monoids. And we already have encountered with some monoids before. For example, we have encountered with monoids in the NCD example here. And also, you also have encountered with monoids, which is like here, okay? <clears throat> so here, here you have group, okay? <clears throat> I'm sorry, so this, this is not more, uh, this is group actually. But uh, I mean, in order to in order to construct the uh, the toric variety, you you have to to deal with monoids, right? Because I mean, you you take the uh, take the uh, the lattice points of the corners. So in this sense, monoids uh, takes part in a very essential role uh, already in the previous examples. And actually, in log geometry, you will deal with monoids. You have to be adept about monoid algebra, al algebra of monoids. So monoid, by monoid in this talk, always I mean a commutative semigroup with, uh, with a unit. So basically I will write monoid uh, binary operation multiplicatively, while some authors prefer to write additively. For example, Olga Spook uh, persists writing additively from the beginning to the end. But uh, from time to time, uh, of course, I'm, I'm, also, uh, I'm also going to write the, uh, the monoid operation additively from time to time. But basically, I keep writing it multiplicatively. So then um, there are a few things you have to uh, keep in mind about the, the algebra of monoids in order to streamline your understanding of the, the later argument. One, one thing is the associated group or Grothendieck group, so to speak. So from monoid, uh, you can functorially construct a group. So this is a, uh, this is a left adjoint uh, of the forgetful functor from the category of gr Abelian groups to the category of monoids. The dis definition is like this. It is like a localization. Okay, so I'm going to use this notation without mentioning any value. And uh, there are some conditions about monoid, monoid themselves. A monoid, P, it's said to be integral if the morphism from P to the P group is injected. So it is like uh, integral integral domain in ring theory, okay? And if uh, a monoid P is said to be fine, if it is integral and finitely generated as monoids, in that case, we will call it fine 
for for the reason I don't know. But uh, I mean, this is the sort of you know convention for more than twenty years. I don't know who was who baptized uh, this uh, this name. I don't know. So uh, a monoid P is called FS. So it is also a very special and very peculiar name. Uh, FS is a shorten of shortening of fine and saturated. Uh, if and only if it is fine and saturated is this condition, which says that uh, any element in the group, P group, such that some power of X belongs to P already belongs to P. That means saturated. So do you, can you, can you imagine any um, easy example of non-saturated monoid? So this can be a, a small exercise for you. Um, for example, I give you one, one example. One example is the, uh, the monoid of natural numbers. I mean, natural number contains zero, okay? Now I'm considering a natural, I'm, I'm considering natural number as an additive monoid, okay? Then uh, you subtract one from here. So that means this is the uh, set consisting of zero, two, three, four, five, and so on and so on. This is actually monoid, okay? And because I mean one is missing, this is not saturated, okay? But this is this is monoid, and this this is actually finitely generated monoid because this is generated by two and three. So this is fine monoid, but it's not saturated. So fine, but not FS. Okay. So here is another example in the in the bottom of the slide. If you have a monoid, which is sharp, sharp means the invertible part consists only of the, of the unit element, NFS, then the group of P, P group is free. And actually your P can be realized as this, is a, is a intersection of M, M is the P group, with some dual of a, a rational strongly convex polyhedral cone, which appears in the theory of toric geometry. So this is a small example you enjoy perhaps during the, during the next break. Okay. <clears throat> so FS and sharp is directly connected to the toric geometry. It's, they are very, very, important in this sense. Okay, so here, these are the monoids. So to which I'm going to. So then I now uh, introduce you the, uh, the definition of log structure here. So in order to define log structure, I have to mention that uh, sheaves are considered with respect to et al topology without mentioning, if, if I do not mention any, anything contrary to this. So the definition starts from the definition of pre-log structure. So if X is a scheme, then a pre-log structure on X is a morphism of sheaves of monoids. From sheaves of monoid to OX, OX is a structure sheave, but OX now it is uh, regarded as a monoid by multiplication, okay? So that's all the definition of pre-log structure. Then, Second, the prelog structure, it's said to be a log structure if the pullback of the invertible part of the structure sheaf is isomorphic to the invertible part of the structure sheaf by the map we are now considering. That means that you have another copy of OX uh, times, OX times inside M. So this is the definition of log structure. So, I mean, first looking, uh, maybe you will think that this is a little strange sort of uh, object that you will gradually realize that this is going to be a very, very natural thing to, to think about in the theory, in the whole theory of log geometry. And uh, because of the definition, you have a, uh, you have a functor from the category of 
pre-log structure on X to the category of log structure on X. This is a forgetful functor. I mean, the pre-log structure, I'm, I'm sorry. So what I'm saying, uh, it's, it's the other way around, I'm sorry. Log structure to the pre-log structure, I'm sorry. Okay, so this is a forgetful functor. But there is a, a left adjoint to this, which is, uh, namely, you have a pre-log structure, then you have the associated log structure. So it is like, for example, uh, you have a sheath associated to a pre-sheath. So the things are very similar to this. So if you have a prelog structure on one hand, then always you can you can form a log structure by uh, push out in the category of monoids, in the category of sheaves of monoids, a so-called amalgamated sum. Okay. So I'm not go I'm not going to you know uh, to describe the, the the precise definition of this amalgam sum. Uh, you will find uh, the definition of this object in any literature about log geometry. So, which is, uh, in the, I mean, now, uh, which is not now, uh, not so important for, for our purpose now. Okay. So, this is a definition. So, then I give you several examples of log structures coming from the, the real phenomena in mathematics. So, one example is a log structure coming from NCD. So which I now, which I would like to call NCD example, NCD situation. NCD is the acronym for the normal crossing divisor. So if you have a smooth uh, scheme over S, smooth scheme over S, and if you have a normal crossing divisor relatively over S inside X, then uh, the complement gives you the open immersion, then this thing, the intersection of the structure sheaf together with the uh, direct image of the invertible part of the open part uh, embedded into the structure sheaf is a log structure, which is the canonical log structure coming from the pair consisting of X and D. And we already have encountered with this sheaf before. So you remember it, right? So this you remember. So now I go back to uh, this, yeah. So I have explained the definition of log differentials. Uh, in, in that slide, we already have had this sheaf, yeah? And this sheaf is the a uh, sheaf consisting of the function uh, to which we uh, have to take the, 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 the log differential in order to form the log differential sheaf, right? So this is the structure we are thinking about. And this is really the log, geomet uh, log structure. So in a sense, I mean, this somehow explains the first reason why we think log structure in this form, in this form. okay? And here is the uh, local description of the log structure, more, more detailed description, description. If the normal crossing divisor D is given by this, by this spec with the, with the relation X1 times up to XR is equal to zero, then the log structure given by here is the log structure of associated log structure, the pre-log structure described by this. So, because I mean this divisor D is defined uh, by the product of X1 up to XR, you can think about the morphism from the R pro direct product of R copies of the natural numbers to the, st uh, the structure sheaf. Um, uh, defined like like this. Okay, then if you take the associated, uh, I mean the so this n r is now considered uh, considered as a constant sheaf on X. Okay, then uh, the associated log structure is actually equal to this log structure. And another 
uh, way of describing this, uh, this log structure is the following. So M is actually the direct image of the log structure. So there is a notion of direct image in the log structure. I'm not going to explain this. Of the trivial log structure, I am going to explain this later. So trivial log structure on, on U. So the open part has a trivial log structure. Trivial means you only have this as a log structure. And you take the direct image log structure on it, onto X, then you get this. So there are several ways of describing this log structure. So many ways. Okay, so now I look at the clock. So then, uh, um, okay, let me, so let me deal with a few more slides and they go to the, is it, then go to, go to the break. Is that okay? Okay. Okay, now I explain the pullback of the log structure. I was mentioning about the direct image. Now I go to the pullback. Pullback is more important, so I have to explain. So if you have a morphism of schemes from X to Y, and if, if you have a, a log structure on Y, then you can pull it back to the log structure on X by taking the associated log structure of this morphism. So in a previous NCD example, so you have a log structure on X, which I have defined, but locally, in order to, in order to make a local description, you first pull it back to a et al neighborhood, V, and take a smooth morphism onto the spec of this form. Okay, this is the fine, a fine scheme over A, uh, a, fine, a fine space over A, a fine R space over A, okay? So V and X are of N dimension. And while this is R space, R dimensional space, so here you have N minus R dimension difference. And that's why I said this is smooth, not at all, okay? Then this part has a log structure coming from this very, uh, nice looking homomorphism of monoids. Homomorphism of monoids, I mean, from NR to the uh, monoid algebra A and R, which is only the uh, polynomial ring of R variables over A. And if you take a log structure defined like this on here, pull it back onto V, then this is the log structure you are considering uh, about from, I mean, by taking, a, uh, putting back the log structure on X onto V. So that's, uh, that's the way I said that the log structure here is, uh, uh, is a local description, it a local description. Okay, so the pullback of log structure can be used in this way. So in this sense, I mean, the pullback is quite, uh, you know, frequently used sort of thing. Okay, so then I can, uh, talk about charts, and maybe this is a good timing for us to take the break after that. So the chart is another way of describing log structure, which is very useful. So if you have a log structure on X, then a chart of X is a morphism sheaves of monoids from a constant sheaf of a monoid P to M such that the associated log structure, the prayer log structure of this composition is isomorphic to M. So the nice point of having chart is that the log structure itself is uh, usually is a very complicated looking and also a kind of big sheaf because it contains the all invertible, invertible elements, invertible functions. But these invertible functions are not so, you know, uh, essential part of the log structure itself. But the most important part is actually the complement of this uh, invertible part. So from time to time, you, uh, you want to have a little more handy way of describing uh, log structure. And the chart is, uh, exists for this reason. The chart is a way of describing log structure by means of constant sheep. Of course, constant sheaves are a much more easier object to deal with. So. So in the NCD example, 
So we, from time to time, go back to this example. So in this example, we, uh, we have an eta local chart of the uh, log structure on X because you have a log structure pulling back to V, the eta neighborhood, which is smooth over this space. And this space has actually uh, this very uh, handy looking homomorphism prelog structure which is described in this way. Yeah, if you pull back this morphism to the, to, to the homomorphism between this uh, monoids, then you get this. This gives you the chart of the logo structure we, are, we were interested in. Okay, so now I have talked around 45 minutes from the beginning, maybe I now take the break for 15 minutes, right? Yes, perfect. 15 okay. minutes will be perfect. Then, Thank you. Uh, uh, let's say we will meet again. Um, At five minute. past. Okay, five past. Okay, very good. Five past uh, five o'clock? Yeah, perfect. In JST. Yeah. Okay, okay. let us have a break. Let's break. Okay. okay, thank you. And now I go uh, yeah. into the second part of my talk. Okay. So, okay, so the next uh, topic I'm going to talk is talk about is fine and FF log structures. Uh, this is a sort of minor uh, thing. Maybe you will you will understand you will understand quickly the definition. So the log structure is said to be fine or FS if there is a chart at all locally uh, from a fine or FS monoids. So that. So. I mean, this requires you two things. So this log structure should have a fine, uh, should have a, I'm sorry, should have a chart, a tau local chart. So it can be described by the constant sheet. And moreover, the, the, uh, the monoid itself has to satisfy some, some monoid theoretic conditions, okay? And here, I would like to mention that uh, if it is, if the log structure is fine, then, what we denote by M bar here, which is actually the quotient of M itself by the invertible functions, is also uh, fine. And FS, I'm sorry, this is fine. It's not fine. This is fine. I'm sorry. Fine. Um, now I think a good timing to mention that this M bar is a very important invariant of the log structure because it measures the real log of your log structure. I said that this invertible function is something non-essential part of your log structure because I mean, it comes from you really the invertible part. But you will see this M, the difference here is really, really measures the log that comes into the scene of your theory or your, of your argument as a log structure. So in this sense, log experts will call this sheaf log. I call sometimes characteristic of the log structure M. But some, somebody said just log. So logo of the log structure is this sheaf. Okay. So now I go to a further example. Um, I'm sorry, exercise. So here is a construction, a small construction chart. So I was mentioning about chart. So here is a, how to, I mean, the general method to construct a chart. So if you have a fine log structure, then there is a sort of uh, general and, and nice way to construct the chart. So you take one point, then you consider the, I'm sorry, so this M should be calligraphy, okay? You take this log, I mean, the stock of the log, group, then uh, because I mean, this is a finite generated abelian group, you have a subjection from a free abelian group. Then you have a, because this is free, you have a lift from Zn to the log structure itself without bar. Then you have this part of the diagram, take the set theoretic Cartesian which I denote by Q, then Q is equipped with the homomorphism T 
to the log structure, the stroke at X, or more precisely, the separable closure of X. Then this extends to the local chart. So you have to work, work a little bit, uh, work, out, work out a little bit to prove this. But as a matter of fact, this extends to the local chart. So this is a general method to construct the chart, especially if your uh, log structure is FS, then as in the last exercise I have posed to you, this group is itself is fine, it's free. So you can just take this to, to, be, just, uh, to be your ZN. In that case, uh, what you get here is just identity, okay? So in that case, uh, you can get, you can take a, a, file, a, a chart by means of the, by means, I'm, I'm sorry, so what am I saying? So this is, aha, uh -huh. oh, I'm sorry. What am I saying? Ah, okay, I should say, I should have said that, then in this case, this Q is isomorphic to the log of, the stock of the log. If, if, uh, if, you, if you take Zn to be just the, the log, the group part of the log, a group, group of the log, Aha, uh -huh, yes, I, I missed the, I'm sorry, I missed the, I missed the bar here. Hmm, I am very sorry for this. I am very sorry. Hmm. So, aha, uh -huh, so. So, here should be bar, I'm sorry. Okay. So anyway, so in FS, you can take the chart, which is just equal to one of the stock of your log. At X, so this this is I, this is what I wanted to say. Okay, now I go to the definition of log schemes. Okay, log schemes. Log scheme is just a pair consisting of scheme and a log uh, and a log structure. And if I refer to the underlying scheme of the log scheme, I would like to just denote it by underlying X, because, uh, I mean, this uh, notation comes from August, uh, August idea. I mean, he said that, I mean, the underlying log scheme should be underlying X, okay? Uh, but, uh, I mean, please be careful. In the, in the beginning of the log, uh, log structure, for example, if you look at the Kazuya Kato's first paper, log schemes are actually denoted by underlying X. So, so things are, I mean, really upside down. I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry for this. I mean, t uh, historically, in old days, log schemes has been denoted by this, but nowadays, log scheme should be, be denoted, should be denoted by just a single character, and the underlying scheme should be denoted by underlying X. So sometimes you will be, you will be confused about it. So please be careful about this. Anyway. <clears throat> Okay, and morphism is, I mean, the morphism log schemes is uh, morphism underlying schemes together with uh, morphism between the log structure defined in this way. So here is the log structure on X and here is a log structure on Y pullback onto X by just a sheaf pullback. Then the square should be commutative. Okay, the log scheme X is fine or FS if the equipped log structure is fine or FS. So very simple definition. Okay. Then I am now going to mention about several examples of log schemes. First example is this. So this, I think, is a quite uh, a little bit new, new, new sort of object for you. It is uh, a fine log scheme. It's coming from a monoid algebra. So you have, if you have a ring A and a monoid P, then always you can form a monoid algebra. For example, if P is the direct product of R copy of the natural numbers, then A bracket n to the r is just a, just a polynomial ring of r 
variables. Okay. If you know the toric geometry, I mean, this sort of object is a kind of a very familiar sort of object for you. Okay. Then you take the scheme, which is just a spec of A bracket P together with the canonical log structure coming from this homomorphism. So you take the associated log structure of this homomorphism, then you acquire the log structure canonically coming only from the data consisting of A and P. Okay, this construction is one of the most important construction and not ba very basic object. So I myself prefer to denote this uh, log, log scheme just like this. Just declaring, uh, I mean, declaring that it, ha it, it has the canonical log structure like this. But uh, August uh, has written, has denoted uh, in his book by this character, by this notation, hmm. where this uh, capital A uh, is not, uh, does, uh, does not have anything to do with our ring A. I mean, in his notation, spec Z bracket P is AP. Uh, I don't like it so much. Anyway, so uh, so please keep in mind this. So I will use this several times from time to time in the sequel. Okay, this example is quite important. Now next, the toric example. Uh, where am I? Ah, oh, yes, toric example. So the toric scheme can be can actually be regarded as a log scheme in the following way. So uh, if A is a ring and N is a co-character group and M is a character group in toric situation, as usual. And if sigma is the rational, strongly convex polyhedral cone in N, then you have the affine toric variety. But look, this construction just matches with our previous example, previous construction, right? It is just the affine scheme of the monoid algebra. So that has the canonical log structure. That means that without saying, without writing anything, we, just, we can just say this is log scheme, okay? So it is so canonical that all these affine piece can, can actually groove. That means that if you start from a fan, then you just have a log scheme, which is the toric variety together with the canonical log structure on each of the affine patches. patches. Okay, they glue to the global log structure. So very beautiful picture, right? And some remarks, the log structure on X sigma is FS. Thus we have a functor from the category of funds to the category of FS log schemes. So everything is canonical and I now would like to mention that this picture has been drastically generalized by Kazuya Kato himself in his paper published in 1994 uh, entitled Toric Singularities uh, from American Journal of Mathematics. This is a very remarkable paper, by the way. I mean, it contains the generalization of the Toric construction and it matches more to the uh, construction of the law schemes. So he can speak about, for example, the general notion of fans equipped to uh, log schemes, not necessarily the atomic schemes. So this, this is a very remarkable paper. So if you are, I think it's, a, it's worth reading if you are, I mean, if you have free time to do. Maybe, I mean, over meal or over lunch, tea. Nice, nice paper, anyway. So then, then I, we go back to the normal crossing divisor. So log scheme from normal crossing divisor. So you, I think you all, all you know. So if you, X is a regular scheme together with a normal crossing divisor, then uh, you have this as the uh, log scheme so that you have a FS log scheme, which represents the pair of X and D. And this, you, uh, this leads to the functor from the category of pairs consisting of regular scheme and normal crossing divisor to the category 
of FS log schemes. That means that the FS log scheme contains, so to speak, the theory of pairs. And here is a tiny example. If you have a discrete valuation ring where pi is the uniformizer, then the zero locus of pi, so to speak, is a divisor on spec V. So you have an NCD relation here also in this uh, example. So you have a log scheme uh, supported on the spectrum of V. Here is another exercise then. This load structure on spec V is actually coming from a chart, which is described by this. The natural numbers mapped to V, where one is mapped to pi, two is mapped to pi square, and so on. Okay. <clears throat> uh, so, so we have mentioned about several examples of log schemes, but uh, I actually didn't say anything about uh, maybe the most important example, which is scheme. Each scheme can be regarded as log scheme, uh, as trivial log, scheme, log structure, uh, trivial log, uh, log scheme. So the, the log structure, which is just equal to the invertible part of the structure shift, is just said trivial log structure. So the reason why it is called trivial, I think you know the reason, because it doesn't have any log. If you take the quotient by OX uh, times, then you only get the trivial monoid. That means that your log is trivial. Uh, in this way, any scheme can be regarded as a log scheme by the trivial log structure. Thus, we have a fully faithful functor from the category of schemes to the category of log schemes. That means the category of log schemes contains the whole, the entirety of the category of schemes. That's why I said that there should be the work of like uh, log EGA, log SGA, log Hatzel. So, so far we have several functors which are described like, uh, right here. So here is a, the category of log schemes to which you have several functors starting from schemes and this is a free faithful functor. And you have a pass, and you also have a toric schemes inside it. So that means that the log scheme, the theory of log scheme, somehow contains all of them inside it. That's why I said yeah, the theory of log scheme is such a broad and uh, nice generalization of the theory, I mean, algebraic and also arithmetic geometry sort of spaces. Okay, uh, okay, so I'm sorry, here is another example. So I'm going to keep on keep, keep tracks of explaining some examples. Uh, one more example is a logarithmic point, uh, which is uh, uh, seemingly a basic, maybe the most basic, but is uh, also quite uh, precocious. So the log logarithmic point is a log, a log scheme supported on the spectrum of a field. So if K is a field and P is a sharp monoid, so what sharp means is that the uh, invertible part of P is, consists only of the neutral element. Then you have a log structure on spec K uh, from the homomorphism from P to K where, where this map maps each element A to one or zero, uh, according to A is one or not one. A little com uh, confusing sort of thing. For example, if you start from the natural numbers, then A is mapped to, mapped to one if it is not one, zero if it is not zero, if, if, if P is N. So it is a little, little confusing. But anyway, so, I mean, if you have sharp monoid and a field, then, I mean, you can define the log, the log structure in this way. And here is a lemma. If K is algebraically closed, then log structure on spec K is of the above form. So this is the first classification theorem of log structure. You see, I mean, 
if you have a if you have a scheme, then you are interested in what kind of log structure this scheme would have. And normally speaking, this problem is very difficult to solve. But if your scheme is spec k where k is algebraically closed, then uh, they can be classified uh, in perfectly like this. <clears throat> Even k is not, uh, if even k is separably, separably closed, if it is not algebraically closed, then the log structure may be, may differ from the, log, uh, the logarithmic point. Because you might have some non-trivial example coming from the direct image of the log structure of its algebraically clo algebraic closure, which cannot be described by this uh, constant shift. So here is a, a little precocious point. So this means uh, that uh, classifying the log structure is sometimes very difficult and sometimes not really. Okay. So yeah, this exercise maybe I can skip. Yeah, mm -hmm. maybe I will mention it later. So then, ah, yes, we, we have to go on like this a little more. Uh, okay. So, um, so we have mentioned about the chart, and here is the time you have you you are going to remember the definition of chart. So, here the definition is the uh, for defining strict morphism. A uh, morphism of log schemes is called strict if the pullback log structure from Y is equal to the uh, is equal to the log structure from X. That means there is no difference between the log structure up here and downstairs. That means that is the definition of the strictness for the morphism. And with this language, a chart can be replaced. I mean, the definition of chart can be replaced as the strict morphism from X to the spec ZP together with the canonical log structure. Okay. And in terms of this language, we can go for defining chart of morphism like this. A chart of a morphism, not for a single space, but for morphism, is a commutative diagram like this, where each row defines charts of X and Y, and a morphism from the right-hand side comes from comes from the homomorphism of the monoid in question. <clears throat> okay. Then having the notion of chart, now I can go to the semi-stable reduction example. Okay. So let us remember what semi-stable reduction is. Semi-stable reduction over, for example, DVR is a morphism from X to S, uh, which is smooth outside the origin and the closed fiber is a normal crossing device. That's the semi-stable reduction in our case. Then you have an NCD log scheme on the spec V, which I have mentioned before, and NCD log on the total space X which I also have mentioned before, because you have a closed fiber, which is, a, which, which is NCD in X. And then you have a morphism from X with that morphism to S with that morphism too. That's the log model of the semi-stable semi -stable reduction. And here is the local description by means of chart. Which is, which is beautiful enough. So from X to S, the structure shift from OS to OX in a sort of, uh, I mean, economical way of writing. I mean, we drop the F inverse. Then the log structure up here is from N to R to OX, where EI goes to XI. Downstairs, downstairs is is given by from N to OS, from which maps one to pi. Okay, then 
here, this morphism should be a diagonal morphism. That makes this square commutative. And this gives you the chart of this morphism, the log version of the log uh, semi-stable reduction. And this will come up, come up later in explaining that this morphism is actually log smooth. Okay. So, um, so the so the organizer pointed to me that I should also mention about the fiber product, right? So here is the here here is the slide explaining the fiber product. So the fiber product log schemes exist. So this, so only I mean only the non-trivial point is how to construct the log structure on the fiber product. I mean the underlying scheme of this here. I mean, if you only, only look at only take, uh, taking the fiber product in the category of whole log schemes, then the underlying uh, scheme is the fiber product of the uh, usual fiber product of schemes. Together with this um, uh, push out of the sheaves of monoids. Okay, but if you go to the uh, more sophisticated categories like fine or FS log schemes, then you have to be a little careful. Uh, actually, the fiber product in the category of fine log schemes is different in general from the, from the fiber product in the category of log schemes because this push out is not necessarily an uh, integral monoid, even MX, MY, MS are integral. So you have to be careful about this. So. Uh, here I have mentioned a little about this careful point. I'm not going to uh, go, I'm not getting into the detail of this. Just careful. Okay. So here is the, here is the reference you keep in mind. So I uh, am a little bit behind the time. So maybe I will speed up a little. Okay. So now comes the log differentials. So uh, differential, log differential should be defined just similarly to the usual Kera differential. So define, it should be defined for a morphism of schemes, uh, morphism log schemes from X to Y. Then omega one X slash Y already means a log differential, okay? Because I mean, uh, this thing Omega one X underline, Y underline is a usual Kera differential, but this is a log version. Okay, so I shall just drop the uh, uh, bracket log. This we don't have to write, we, uh, if you agree. We are now, I mean, entirely working on log, working, working with log geometry. So this is the most, impo uh, most uh, natural thing to think about as a differential, which is actually defined to be the uh, usual Kera differential of the X underlying over Y underlying plus something in addition coming from the log structure group divided by some relation. Okay, now relation consists of two types. One is this, the other one is this. I'm going to explain a little bit about these relations. Maybe this relation is not so important for me to, ex to explain about, because, I'm, because this kills the contribution from the, from the base space. So this is not so important. Mm -hmm. But this sheaf comes with the uh, exterior derivative and log derivative. Exterior derivative is just this, while the log derivative uh, maps A inside the log, st log structure to one tensor A tilde, where A tilde is the image of A in the group of log structure. So that means D log A is like one times A. Okay, then having this knowledge we can interpret this relation to be dA is equal to A times D log A. 
Can I write? E A is equal to A times D log A. So that means D log A should be like D A over A. So exactly the log, log differential is now coming out here. Okay. So, so uh, in this way, the, I mean, we can explain that, uh, that this definition is so reasonable. And actually this definition is so successful that it can, uh, we can uh, prove many theorems starting from this definition. For example, I mean, if X and Y are strict, X to Y is strict, then the log differential just coincides with the classical differential. And if you have a Cartesian diagram like this, then the differential behaves like this, just, just as expected. And if you have this uh, uh, chain of morphism, then you have this usual exact sequence in a classical setting in log situation. Okay, and in a toric scheme situation, the log differential can be, can be interpreted as like this, which generalize what I have talked, what I have mentioned in the example of toric varieties in relation to the Ishida's complex. So this is just a usual sort of general, uh, I mean, the, the general, generalization of this, coming from the, def the definition of log differentials, okay? So it's very natural way of defining it. So what's happening if I apply this definition to the known uh, NCD situation? In that case, the, as you expect, the differential we have defined is just isomorphic to the log differential, the classical log differential. And here is the et al. local description. If X is the affine space, if D is the normal causing divisor defined by this relation, then X has a strict smooth morphism onto spec A bracket and R. So here, this is n-dimensional here, it is r-dimensional, so you have a smooth morphism here of relative dimension n minus r. Okay. Then from this picture, you can actually calculate the log differential by means of this toric description. Then what you get is this is actually this. Is just uh, what we have uh, described in the beginning of the introduction. Okay. <clears throat> Another example is a semi-stable semi reduction. So if you have a semi-stable reduction picture for, uh, over to over the, disc, uh, the discrete valuation ring B, then the relative differential, log differential is just a re relative log differential I have described before. Here is our description. Our um, semi-stable reduction is described by means of this diagram, where X prime is the Cartesian coming from this toroidal situation, together with some strict smooth morphism, which adds some N minus R relative dimension. Okay, then the log can be described perfectly by this diagonal morphism. That means that the omega one here is the log differential shift divided by some relation coming from the base. That, that is this, the sum of all uh, log differential of the coordinate is equal to zero. Okay, now comes, so I have 15 minutes in explaining rest of the log geometry part. So now comes the log smoothness, okay? 
So uh, log smoothness is the most important part. So maybe I should take a little more time to explain this. Uh, log smoothness is uh, is like is defined uh, just like the usual smoothness in the usual algebraic geometry. So how do we define smoothness in algebraic geometry? So one way of doing is by new potent thickness, like in EGA or SGA. Hence, in order to do it, in order to mimic it, we have to have the log version of the thickness, and that's why I put a definition here. The definition is about exact closed immersion, so to speak, and thickening. So S0 to S is called exact closed immersion if it is strict and closed immersion. So this should be should have been called strict uh, closed immersion. I mean, in retrospect from now, but at that moment, I mean, there is, there is no terminology strict and exactness I mean, there is also a notion of exactness. It can apply to this situation. That's why it is called exact closed immersion. Uh, I do not explain what exactness is. You will find in literature anywhere. So the second one is that S0 to S is thickening of order up to N is uh, exact closed immersion and kernel to the power N plus one is equal to zero. Okay. So it is quite uh, just as just the same as the usual thickening. Uh, the only the difference is that you impose a strictness in, I mean, relatively onto the low structure. Okay, having this uh, notion, we can go on to the uh, definition of log smoothness and log et al. F is said to be log smooth or log et al. If First of all, F underline is locally a final presentation, as usual. And the second one is an important thickening lifting property. If you have this commutative diagram consisting of X, Y, and a thickening of order up to N, or up to one, I'm sorry. Then you have a diagonally lifting morphism making the resulting triangles commutative. And if this lifting exists uniquely, then you say that this is log et al. So this is really a honest mimicking of what uh, is done for defining smoothness and et alness. For example, in EGA4 or SGA1 expose, uh, third expose, section three. Okay, <clears throat> so, so this is a general, general definition. So let us interpret this definition into more down to us uh, terms. For example, uh, monoid algebra case, then the log smoothness and log etalness can be interpreted into a little more, in, a little more easy uh, way of description. For example, if you have a morphism from X to Y coming from a homomorphism of monoids from Q to P, like this. This is a toroidal uh, situation, I said. And you take K to be the kernel of the Q group to P group, and C is a co kernel of it. Then F is log smooth if K and C torsion part are finite end of order invertible in A. Okay. And F is log et al if K and C itself are finite of order invertible in A. So this is a fundamental lemma which has been proven by Kazuya Kato. The proof you can see in the first paper by Kazuya Kato. Rollery, any toric scheme over spec A with trivial log structure is actually log smooth because of this. In that case, um, uh, in that case, because I mean the, the base space A has trivial log structure, Q is a trivial monoid. So then uh, C doesn't have torsion part because P group is free. 
and kernel is of course uh, trivial. So this condition apply. That means that your toric scheme is actually log scheme, uh, log smooth scheme. Okay. And developing this, uh, Kazuya Kato acquired to a more fantastic, uh, perfect toroidal characterization of log smoothness, which I would like to mention next. Okay, so the theorem which has been proven by Kazuya Kato and contained in his paper, in his paper uh, about, I mean, the first paper of the log geometry uh, says the following. A morphism f x to y is of fine log schemes is log smooth or log et al. if and only if uh, it allows an et al local chart described by place where from Q to P satisfies the corresponding uh, conditions similar to the previous one. K and C torsion part are finite of order in vertigo X or K and C itself. Okay, so this is a, uh, the, the same condition as previously. And the second condition is that uh, from this commutative diagram, mm -hmm. we have an induced morphism from X to this fiber product, which is strict smooth in the usual sense, or strict et al in the usual sense. <clears throat> so the log part, uh, log structure itself is determined entirely by this. So the other part should be strict. And this other part should also be smooth or strict in the usual sense, in order for F itself to be log smooth or log eta. So a very reasonable situation. I give you some examples before uh, getting to the second break. So examples, for, uh, first example is tame covering. So if uh, you have a morphism from spec AT to spec AT, so it is a covering space, covering coming from the modification by N which is log et al if n is invertible in A, even though it, 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 it has a ramification. But this ramification part uh, is, is in the center of the log, which has been somehow magic powdered into log et al, right? So many people think that it is very weird, but uh, in log geometry, this is a very natural thing. It is et al, okay? Uh, another thing, uh, may, uh, maybe this second example is more shocking, uh, log modification. So if Q is inside P, uh, satisfying that Q group is equal to P group. I mean, this situation comes, for example, from the, from the subdivision of fun or toric grow-ups. So this is a very, very usual situation. Then the uh, induced morphism is just is, uh, is really log et al. That means that blow up is log et al. So log et al even doesn't imply flatness on, on the uh, underlying scheme. So maybe some people would think it is very, very strange. But from, for example, toric point of view, I mean, this is quite a uh, natural sort of thing. And also from log geometry point of view. So now I have three more slides to finish the whole uh, explanation about log geometry. Mm -hmm. So another example, NCD. NCD uh, example gives you the log smooth uh, space. So X with normal crossing divisor gives you the uh, log scheme X, which is actually log smooth over the base with trivial structure, trivial log structure. This you can prove by means of the by means of Kazuya Kato's uh, characterization, and now comes the semi-stable reduction. Okay, semi-stable reduction can be um, can be entirely described by this homomorphism diagonal and this strict movement. and this uh, point should obey the uh, first condition. 
course, it satisfies the first condition, right? The kernel is trivial, and the core kernel doesn't have any, uh, doesn't, doesn't have torsion, right? Okay. And here is strict and smooth. So the second condition is also satisfied. That means that the slope, a semi-stable reduction is log smooth, even though it has non-smooth central fiber. So that's why it is called magic powder. <clears throat> okay, now uh, I would like to finish by two slides explaining the log smoothness and log differentials. So the proposition says that uh, if F is log smooth or log et al, then the differential is locally free or equal to zero. Just as usual. So it's, it's a very honest generalization. Theorem X, Y, Z morphism like this. And if F is log smooth or log et al, then this is exact and split locally. Or this isomorphism occurs. Uh, and if uh, the composition of this morphism is log smooth and this uh, exact sequence uh, split et al locally, then F is actually log smooth. So this is a, so to speak, Jacobian criterion for the smoothness, the log version of the Jacobian criterion. Okay, so now comes the final. So I, in this one slide, I would like to mention a little about the Olson's log stack work, uh, because this is a very important work. So Olson's stack, so he has defined a stack starting from a fine log scheme, S, to, uh, he defined a category log S, which is turned out to be a step actually. Objects are morphism from a log scheme to S. Morphisms are strict morphisms over S. Then, uh, then it is quite, uh, how to say, surprising for us that this category actually is an algebraic stack. Uh, Altin algebraic stack with mm -hmm. some a particular condition on the uh, on the diagonal uh, uh, diagonal embedding. <clears throat> so, in this way, one has a two functor from the category of fine log structure to the two category of algebraic stack. So, a very nice point of this functor is that this can, uh, in effect, this can be re regarded as a sort of embedding. That means that the geometry and also many, many things occurring in this category of log schemes can be interpreted into the category or two category of log stack, uh, algebraic stacks. And here, for example, you have a notion of smoothness or etalness or flatness, and you can interpret into, uh, uh, interpret these notions into a uh, log scheme by means of this two functor then you will find, for example, the smoothness here interpreted onto this category by this functor is the log smoothness, actually. And etalness here corresponds to log etalness. And similarly, flatness also coincides with the flatness here, uh, log flatness here. So I have not mentioned about log flatness. So everything, almost everything in the, in the geometry of log schemes can be honestly and very faithfully interpreted into algebraic stacks. And we know much about algebraic stack geometry because they are very similar to the geometry of schemes. Of course, I mean, algebraic stacks are very, very difficult sort of objects sometimes, but uh, uh, people would think that they are much more familiar than log schemes. But in this way, they are interrelated. So the log scheme things can be interpreted into algebraic stack. So you will find uh, many, many geometry uh, coming from the geometry of algebraic stuff. In this way, this is a very, very beautiful sort of picture. So all of this story is written in this paper. So I think now comes the time for us to take another break. Is that okay? Uh, another 15 minutes? Yes. Okay. Okay, so then I go to the third part, uh, uh, namely the survey of my very old work in my doctor thesis. 
uh, it is about the moduli of log curves, log stable curves. So, um, so this starts from the definition of log, log curves. So, I mean, already you you have uh, you have encountered with some of the terminology in the in the definition. So, a log curve over an FS log scheme S is a log smooth and integral. So, this integrality I will explain later. Integral morphism F from X to S of FS log schemes, uh, whose geometric fibers are reduced and connected curve. So geometric fibers are, I mean, the underlying scheme of the geometric fibers are reduced and connected curve. So I only impose the reducedness, connectedness, and log smoothness, and some additional condition, which is integrality, which is written on the, on the footnote of this slide. Integral for amorphism is, so to speak, a monoid version of flatness. So this is closely related to the Benjamin's first question. Yep. So the, because the log smoothness doesn't imply flatness in the underlying schemes, I should impose something similar to this in order to make the notion of log smooth behaving uh, reasonably. The integrality and log smoothness imply that the underlying scheme is flat. The integral, integrality of the morphism is defined in terms of uh, this last three lines of the slide. You see, I mean, this is a little bit complicated uh, uh, definition, but it somehow mimics the characterization of flatness by means of relations. Uh, you will find it in Brubaki algebra, commutative algebra, the first volume. Yeah. So, the, the important, exam, uh, important conditions for the log curve is that it is log smooth and integral. And of course, also the underlying scheme should be reduced and commuted. So then, um, uh, any geometric connected smooth curves are log curves with trivial log structure. So, I mean, log curve contains the usual smooth curves. Uh, log smoothness and integral, as I said, implies that the underlying morphism is flat. Okay, this is a definition of log curves, that's all. And then I'm going to give you the classification of log curves in the next few slides. So log curves over a separately, separably closed field are characterized like this. Um, so this is my theorem. Uh, so let f x to s, where s is the spectrum of a field, a separately closed field, together with some log structure, be a log curve. Then first, the underlying scheme x has at most k split, k split ordinary double point. Second, the stops of the relative characteristic, so to speak, defined to be the quotient of the log structure upstairs divided by the quotient of the log structure downstairs. That measures the difference of the log structure in between upstairs and downstairs. R described as follows. Let R1 up to RL be the set of all, all double points of the underlying X. Okay, because we know that the singularity is at most case split ordinary double points is reasonable to think about all these double points, then there exists a finite set, finite additional set S1 up to Sn of closed points, such that this relative characteristic, the stock of this is either Z or N or zero, according as the X is a double point or X is the additional smooth point or otherwise. So this somehow classifies the relative structure of the log structure on the log curve. And from this, you will see that the log structure knows the double point and the marked points and all the smooth other smooth points. So that means that the log curve contains the notion of 
marked points. I mean, usually marked points are defined in terms of sections, but in log situation, uh, it is just, I mean, built in, in the structure of log structure. Okay. <clears throat> so already this uh, theorem has a complicated proof actually, a little bit. So I'm not going to, into the uh, proof of this, but uh, this can be, this, this is a doable sort of thing. And another uh, theorem about the local structure of the log structure of log curve is the following. So I keep uh, working with the uh, log curve over the separately closed field together with some log structure, which is not specific. Okay. Then the, the log structure of the base scheme is actually a log point. And around a double point upstairs, the log structure is looking like this, where n square is coming from the NCD sort of uh, log structure. I mean, this should remind, remind you of the semi-stable reduction situation, but you have some additional part which comes from the downstairs. Okay, and around the mark point SJ, the log structure is just the product of one extra N together with the log structure coming from downstairs. While in the double point case, I mean back in a double point case, this is not a direct product, but is a amalgamated product where N inside N square is a diagonal. So this should remind you of, of the uh, uh, semi-stable reduction situation. And around other smooth points, F is just strict. So the log structure is just coincides with the log structure coming from downstairs. So this, uh, uh, this theorem and the previous theorem perfectly more or less perfectly describes the log curve, the structure of log curves over separably closed field. So the task is done for the classification of log curves over separably closed field. Okay, and having this uh, classification, we can talk about the stable log curves, the notion of stable log curves. So uh, definition that S uh, be an FS log scheme we are a separate closed field a stable log curve over this space of type G comma N is a proper log curve such that G is the arithmetic genus of the underlying scheme. And N is the number of the uh, marked points where the marked points now is uh, coming from the log structure. So it is exactly the number of points uh, such that the relative characteristic is, iso is, is isomorphic to N. And finally, the infinitesimal uh, automorphism, which can be measured by the H0 cohomology of the dual of the log uh, differential, is equal to zero. That means no infinitesimal autismal automorphism. CF, I mean, this uh, refers to my master thesis, uh, this uh, log smooth deformation. Okay, so. Uh, this gives you the, uh, the definition, I mean, the general, uh, generalization of the stable curves, notion of stable curves. In this context, proposition, the, uh, in this situation, the uh, log differential can be uh, described in this way, where this small omega is the usual dualizing uh, sheaf uh, in, the, in the usual, I mean, the classical, uh, I mean, nodal curve case. So this is a log, log differentials together with some marked points. And another proposition means that uh, the log smooth deformation of uh, this thing is unobstructed with a tangent dimension exactly equal to 3g minus 3 plus n, which comes from my master thesis. <coughs> 
Okay, so so far everything is good. So I mean, log curve. The notion of log curve behaves quite well, and we would like to go on. Uh, try to understand, trying to understand the log log curves in such a way that we can construct a moduli, whole moduli of them. Okay. <clears throat> In order to do this, we need to have uh, another very important notion of log curve, which I call basic log curve. And in, in order to explain this, I have to start from uh, one category. Uh, this uh, way of explanation is somehow different from, which, different from the explanation I have done in my original paper. But now I take up this way of explanation because I think it's more uh, streamlined, somehow, more clear. Okay, so this is a notion of basic curves, which, which is start from a usual classical notion of stable curves of type Gn. So y to spec A is a stable curve where A is a strict Hensian local ring, let us assume, uh, together with some uh, n sections from spec A to Y in the classical sense, stable curves. Then we consider the following category, which I denote by L, Y over A. The objects are stable log curves, F from X to S of type GN, such that the underlying uh, morphism of F is just equal to G and the marked points by log structure equals to the, un, uh, the marked points coming from the sections. That's the object. And morphisms uh, from F to F prime uh, are commutative diagrams like this, such that the underlying morphism with the horizontal arrows are just identity. So this is a category classifying all possible log structures making the stable curve of type Gn to be a log curve of type Gn. And there are several many possible ways of log structure we can imagine, but we are now going to, uh, we are now trying to classify all the possible log structure by means of this categorical language. So you, you understand what I'm, what I'm now going to do. Okay, because I mean, uh, to classify log structure is sometimes very difficult. So we are now uh, trying to do this task. So this is the most important part of this uh, story. Then, actually, maybe this is the most important theorem in my thesis is the following. This category actually has a terminal object, which I denote by F basic from X basic to S basic, which we call a basic log curve. And a remark, a nice remark perhaps, uh, Abramovich calls this uh, notion minimal log, log curve in his uh, writings. And I agree with, the, with this section of terminology. But at that moment, uh, uh, I prefer to use basicness because this is very basic. and. Uh, Maybe uh, minimality is also good, but I, did, I didn't have this uh, I mean, way of uh, viewing the things like this, I mean, categorical way of viewing. From this viewing, maybe minimality is more natural uh, sort of terminology. But I, 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 I would like to keep my terminal uh, mm -hmm. by the end of my talk, <clears throat> until the end of my talk. Okay, so the corollary of this theorem says that any stable log curve of type Gn over any S uh, of uh, strictly Hanselian local ring can be obtained by pulling back by a unique morphism from S to S bus uh, with identity underlying morphism. That means that any possible log structure of the log curve can now be classified perfectly uh, just only knowing the basic log structure upside, upstairs and downstairs. 
So this gives you the perfect picture of classification of all possible log strategies. But how can it be done? So in the in the next slide, I'm going to I try to explain how to construct, and I try to convince you that this is really basic, which is uh, really minimal. So this slide consists of the construction on your left hand side, and right hand side is a picture, handwritten. And by this, I would like to explain what the basic log curves are. So, um, so first of all, maybe we should look at the picture for the first. The picture consists of two parts. So this is the this is your nodal curve over over some base, which is now denoted by just a point. But you would think that this is uh, this is a strict Hanselian local ring. Okay. Then um, your curve in this example, this particular example, consists. Uh, the central fiber is uh, has three double points and one marked point. Okay, and the uh, corresponding log structure is described symbolically by this right hand side of the picture. So the base has three copies of N corresponding to three double points. And you should understand each one of M to be a, a, a smoothing parameter of corresponding double points. Okay. So each N goes on to a, a continuously a log structure on, on, on the total space while each double point gives you some extra addition to this corresponding n, namely n square occurs pointedly corresponding to the double points. And the n from the bottom uh, is embedded into this n square diagonally. Okay. And corresponding to the marked point, you have the isolated N, which doesn't have any anything over, anything coming from the uh, from the base, which is like hovering N. Okay, and this N uh, is responsible for changing the position of this marking point by log smooth deformation. Okay, while this N on the base are responsible for the smoothing of each double points by log smooth deformation. Okay, that's the general picture of the log, basic log curve together with the basic log structure. Okay, how do I construct this? The construction is like this. So let D be the set of all double points where the eyes now is a uh, double point if you consider the, the nodal curve over, over, over a field. But if it is over some more general, general base, then you argue that D is the zero locus of the first fitting ideal of the uh, classical uh, differential module. That is a locus of the failure of the locally freeness of this module that corresponds to the double locus. And you decompose this D into the connected components. And each connected component should be, uh, should be deformed to uh, smoothed by one parameter. So mm -hmm. each connected component should correspond to one copy of N in the, in the base, okay? So in order to achieve this, I first consider UI to be the complement of DJs where J is not equal to R, okay? Then this looks like, uh, it are locally looking like XY is equal to TI. So this is the ith uh, double point. So this UI is the neighborhood of the ith double point. 
So now we have this UI, so we can endow the semi-stable reduction log structure on UI and also spec A, the double, I mean the base, base space. And extend it to the whole Y uh, by, strict, by strictness. Okay, so this we call ALI on the base and MI on the total space. And we collect all of them. <clears throat> ah, I'm sorry. So before that, I have to also deal with the, uh, the marked points. So N should be the normal crossing divisor log coming from the marked points of the complement of the uh, discriminant locus. Yeah, and I extend it uh, trivially onto D. That's the another log structure N. Then the log structure on X should be the product of all M1 up to ML together with the another additional log structure coming from the mark point. And the log structure downstairs is L1 plus up to LI. That's our like log structure of the parameters, the deformation parameters. So that's the explanation of the basic log structure. And I hope that you think this is beautiful and this is basic, and actually this is very, very minimal. And uh, of course, I mean, proof, uh, for the proof, you have to work out a uh, little more, but uh, uh, the construction is quite uh, natural and uh, it is also um, possible to, to show that this log structure gives you the minimal log structure in the sense I have previously mentioned. <clears throat> and moreover, I mean, this construction can be globalized. So theorem, the existence of basic log structure for any scheme S. So this uh, now the base scheme is not necessarily the local, local ring, but it's just a scheme for any scheme and a stable log pair of type GN in a classical sense, there exists uniquely a log structure MX and on Y and log structure MS on spec A. I'm sorry, what is spec A? Oh, I'm sorry, so A. Uh, A is, uh, A is uh, arbitrary ring and S is the uh, log, log scheme having spec A as the underlying. Maybe I'm tired enough. So, uh, MS on spec A, such that this, uh, you have this morphism of log schemes satisfying the following two conditions. Uh, A, the marked points by the sections SI coincide with the marked points by log, and moreover, for any X on a base, uh, the strict hensorization at X gives you, by Plubach, the basic log curve, which I have cons uh, considered previously, okay? So this is a global part. And of course, I mean, this is, uh, this is uh, technically more hard because uh, uh, of course, I mean, this is technically uh, kind of a harder part of my theory, but uh, morally speaking, this theorem is the most important part. Uh, I think you all agree with. I mean, this, uh, this uh, gives you the, the perfect classification of the possible log structure. <clears throat> Okay, so having all this, now I go on to the, uh, the theory of modular, of log curves. In order to do this, I somehow try to interpret the, the story of log geometry in terms of stacks. So now I go on to mention about the log structure on stacks. So here, stack means, always means stack in group voice, and which is not necessarily algebraic. Sometimes it, it should be algebraic, but uh, I mean, I don't care about the algebraicity of, the, of my stack. So the definition, uh, log structure on a stack here. So the stack, which is over S scheme with the topology, et al. topology, is a functor L from your stack to the category of log schemes over S with trivial log structure such that the diagram, resulting diagram should commute, and that the, uh, 
the functor sends every morphism to a strict morphism here. And you will find, if you work a little bit, if you find that this is the most natural way of defining a uh, log structure on a stack. For example, if your stack comes from a scheme, if it is represented by a scheme, then this uh, gives you back the definition of the log structure on your scheme. So let us say that a stack with this log structure is a log stack. Uh, log schemes can be realized as a log stack by putting back log. Uh, log. This is a small exercise for you. <clears throat> and if you replace this part, LSSCH by LSCHFS, for example, then you have a notion of FS log structure on a stack. Okay. <clears throat> then um, from this notion of log stack, uh, you have the associated stack over the category of log schemes. So we have two notions of stacks. So a stack with log structure, stack in a usual sense over schemes with log structure and a stack over the category of log structure. And we, I, I'm now distinguish these two. And this is the second one, you see. So we consider the log, the category of log schemes over the uh, underlying scheme of S with trivial log structure with the strict et al topology. So it is et al and strict. Then uh, we have a construction, general construction from log stack to a stack over log schemes. So if you have a log stack consisting of a usual stack together with the log structure on it, then you have a category X log of which the objects are morphism from a log scheme Y to your stack, a log stack, and the morphism from Y over X to Y prime over X is a X morphism. Okay. That's the that's a construction of this category. And then you have a morphism this from this category to the log schemes by sending y to x to y itself. Then you can show that this gives you a stacking groupoids over the category of log schemes over s. So in this sense, you have a sort of a uh, functor from the log, uh, from the, uh, the uh, category of log stacks to the category of stacks over log schemes. So he, and this is the general construction of this and definition. So, I mean, I'm not so uh, fond of this uh, terminology, but I just keep my original terminology. A stack F over the category of log schemes is represented by a log stack if this F is. Uh, Isomorphic to isomorphic as a stack to x log coming from x l. Okay, <clears throat> so we have two notions of stacks, but they are somehow interrelated. You can construct them, the stack over log schemes from log stacks. And having these languages, we can describe the moduli stack of log curves in the following way. Okay, the stack of log curves. Now I define this category, which the objects are log stable curves of type G N, and morphisms from X over S to X prime over S are Cartesian diagrams like this. Then it is not so difficult to see that this gives you a stack over the category of log schemes. I mean the FS log schemes. <clears throat> then my final theorem, which is actually the main theory of my doctor thesis, is the basic log uh, is, is this theorem downstairs. Uh, actually, this stack is represented by a, by a kind of log stack. And this log stack actually is a Dorini Manfold, classical Dorini Manfold stack together with some. Uh, naturally defined log structure. 
So the local structure is defined in terms of, uh, I mean, uh, is, is, is a, a by, by this uh, construction. So you, so M bar G N is a classical stack, the linear manifold stack of moduli of stable curves of type G comma N and for X over S, I'm sorry, here N should be calligraphy. Uh, for X over S, then you consider the basic log curve associated to X over S. Then this gives you the FS log structure on this stack because basic log structure is completely functorial. <clears throat> and remark, this log structure should be understood as the NCD log by the discriminant locus. Okay, then the theorem says that my stack over the category of FS log scheme is represented by this log stack with the underlying stack to any amount for the stack with the basic log structure. So this was the main theorem. <clears throat> so this is the all the contents uh, in my uh, in my work about the log curves. And uh, now I think it is going to finish my time of my talk. So before doing that, I would like to mention one more slide in which I, will, I somehow collected the related works, uh, which are more new, I mean, uh, at least this century. So uh, my story consists of uh, the representability that comes from the minimality of the log structure. That was the main sort of stream of my theory. So that's why I, 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 hear, I have written here, the minimality implies the representability. And this uh, story actually has been generalized and more uh, fantastically uh, argued by Gillan uh, in his uh, paper, Logarithmic Stacks and Minimality in International Journal of Mathematics, eight years ago. So here you find the more generalized picture of this Minimality or basicness implies representability. <clears throat> and uh, I also would like to mention about the moduli of log stable maps. Uh, this has been developed by many, many people, including Gross Siebelt and Abramovich, Chen, Marcus Wise, and many others, which I must have missed many names, I think. <laughs> And uh, the story is quite similar. Of course, I mean, they, they, uh, they are technically more difficult, but the, quite, uh, the stories are li a little bit uh, quite similar. They also pursue the basic or minimal sort of log structure in order to acquire with the, uh, the similar story to have a modular space. So the thirdly, um, in the beginning of my lecture, I had mentioned about the mixed this structure, and I have never get back to that story again. So I think I should uh, mention something about the log version of the Hodge structure sort of story. So there is a notion of log Hodge structure developed by Kazuya Kato and Sanpei Usui, and he, uh, they have written a book uh, published from Princeton University Press, a very impressed, uh, impressive book. In, in this, they uh, uh, recovered uh, the uh, toroidal compactification or a partial compactification of the Hodges, uh, period of space of Hodge structure by means of logs, log uh, structure or log geometry. Finally, I would like to mention about the log abelian varieties and their moduli has been developed entirely by three people, Kajiwara, Kazuya Kato and Nakayama, and their works are now coming out gradually, and are very, uh, they are almost completed. It's a very wonderful uh, piece of works. And I do not know the, the precise relationship about this minimality story and their log abelian variety moduli, because I mean, they, uh, they fixed the, the log structure from the beginning in, his, uh, in their in their definition of log abelian variety. But I think there should be something. Uh, I mean, this sort of story also comes into this picture. Uh, this is my intuition, but I don't know any much about this. So that's all what I would like to say. 
So thank you very much for all. Thank you.